Okay, thank you. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me for uh, having this talk. I changed my title a bit from machine learning to data modeling because actually I use the terms like synonymously. And yeah, machine learning is a bit buzzword, as you all know. Um, okay, but what we are going to talk uh, during my 30 minutes. So first I will give you a super short uh, intro about me, fandom and data we have. And then we'll go step by step uh, through the process of machine learning on or data modeling and where Python can be helpful and which libraries can be actually used. And after that, I hope there, there will be time for, <laughs> for questions uh, and I will not talk too much. Uh, so after this presentation, I would like you to uh, know which Python libraries can be used and actually using really simple uh, libraries, you can actually go from idea to production. And this is not like the best setup, uh, but this is a setup that works for us. Uh, so just uh, an example here. And also, yeah, I would like you to have the idea that uh, data modeling, machine learning is no magic and actually we can get really good results with really simple solutions. So, as a lot of people on this conference, I have like bio uh, history behind me. Uh, and I also studied computer science and now I work as a data analyst in fandom. And uh, I'm doing a lot of things from data analysis to data science through uh, products, uh, communication, and um, this is why I will also be talking about all of the steps and also how to communicate the results. And I work mostly with ad engineering, and you will see an example of uh, data modeling uh, connected with ads. So I hope some of you at least uh, know what Fandom is. And Fandom is a company that uh, provides hubs for communities that are really uh, fans of something or uh, games or TV series or movies. Uh, our users come to our pages to share their knowledge, to share uh, their love for, uh, for those um, games or, uh, or TV series. And we have thousands of those communities. So it uh, goes to thousands of page views and uh, thousands of users every day. This is a couple of examples of the communities we have. So as you can see, TV shows um, are here. And we do love data, and as you can imagine, uh, from those thousands of communities, thousands of users, we have a lot of them. And we gather the data, um, we have data in different data sources. We have uh, our data warehouse, currently it lives uh, on S3, we use Athena, and so on. Uh, those are data that uh, most of it is generated on the front end, some eventing, what a e uh, user is doing. And we try to use it to make our pages uh, um, better, so experience for the user better. Uh, okay, and we have a lot of different data sources like GA, Firebase for apps, uh, Google Ad Manager for ads metrics, and also some uh, third-party data. So moving to the main part, machine learning process, we will start with the idea. Uh, you can get idea for the machine learning project from various sources. You can have like super uh, product manager who just comes up with another idea every week. Uh, but actually most of the ideas that actually uh, went to production for us uh, came from a data, from data analysis. So during uh, some analysis, we observed some trends and we wanted to understand what's going on. And if we can use those trends um, or those insights to actually uh, improve the experience, improve our pages. And uh, the first setup uh, I want you to, I want to present to you this is one of the setups that can be used for data analysis. Definitely, you can have different, like Excel and Tableau. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm really big fan of Python. And uh, fortunately, we, we have set up uh, that um, we can use it. So we have Jupyter Hub to analyze. So many of you 
uh, I think, uses uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, we use PySpark because we have data on S3 and it's easy, really easy to, uh, to access the data uh, this way if you want to scan a lot of it. Uh, for less um, complicated tasks, we use pandas and numpy to wrangle the data, matplotlib, seaborn for visualization, like simple visualization, and if we need um, uh, interactions, we can use bokeh and plotly. And last but not least, we use Sroka, and this is time for advertisement first. So Sroka is our open source Python library that we developed in fandom. And what it does, it takes the data from different data sources in a really simple way. So you have sing single function to actual, uh, actually d gather the data, and it returns the data in the same format. In our case, it's Pandas uh, data frame. And why Sroka? Uh, because Sro Sroka is believed to uh, pick up shiny things, and we believe data is shiny. And it takes the data from different sources, so it fits. And currently, Sroka is able to connect to those nine uh, data sources. And another one that is on the way uh, is Neo4j databases. And it's open source, so if you want to contribute and add other data sources, um, yeah, just contact us or create a pull request. OK, but going back to uh, idea. So I will um, use the actual example of uh, video ad completion rate uh, that we analyze in the company. Video ad completion rate is a metric that we use, for example, in ads to measure how many of the all video ads that we showed were watched to the end. And where we, when we were analyzing it, we observed that video ad completion differ between different uh, ad campaigns, and it wasn't connected with length of the ad but it was somehow connected with users, with type of pages, communities, so there was some signal of the data, and we wanted to see if we can use it, if we can actually get the trend, get the information from the data to predict better traffic, so better traffic, I mean, with higher video completion rate. So, as I said, we would like to have better traffic, however, in a case of machine learning, we have to uh, rephrase it a bit. So on each page view that have uh, page view that has um, video, we would like to predict if user will complete the video ad or not. So uh, we uh, rephrased it to the classification binary binary classification problem. Okay, so we have our um, idea now. Data preparation. Uh, I really love this part. I know um, most of the people. Uh, like better the modeling part, uh, but I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, however, what we should um, look at during data preparation. So first of all, what features uh, should we include in the model? And how those features should look like. So how our data should look like. So um, algorithms that we want to use uh, will work well with the data because we can Imagine that we will uh, use scikit-learn, uh, we will use TensorFlow, we, we can uh, use different algorithms like uh, decision trees and logistic regression. And there are some differences between uh, how we should prepare the data and what's okay in the data and what's not. Um, so during the data preparation, we should consider uh, this one. And about features, um, uh, about features, we can uh, have three types of features in at least web uh, modeling as, as we do. So we can have simple features that are directly taken from our data. So for example, I can know uh, from which country the user is. It's really just asking the data warehouse um, uh, where the user is from. So this like what I, ca what I call a simple feature and we have complex features. So for example, we have uh, in the data warehouse information about videos watched uh, by the user, but we don't have like direct metric um, number of videos that user watched in the last three days. So the data is there, but we have to uh, manipulate it a bit, um, wrangle it to get the, um, the features. And But yeah, we, we can definitely use it. And the third thing uh, that we can consider are uh, the information that we don't have, but we think 
should be, could be uh, important for the goal that we're trying to achieve. Um, let's say we don't have implemented scrolling of the user on our page, but we think that this is like super important. Um, so we can ask the front-end team, can you implement those events uh, for us? We can wait and we can include it later uh, in the model. However, I'm not a big fan of the waiting for those, for those features. Um, I think it's better to proceed with what you have and at the same time uh, requesting uh, the new data and you can add them later um, when they're ready because the process of implementing verification the data is really good. Um, take, takes time. Okay, and uh, the libraries that we use for data preparation are not so different. Uh, again, we use uh, JupyterHub, Iceberg, Pandas, Matplotlib so for some visualizations, Roka, but also here uh, you can see SKLearn because SKLearn has a lot of uh, helpful functions. For example, if you have thousands of features but you want to focus first on 100 that seems um, best and uh, you want to exclude features that correlate uh, with each other too strongly, uh, there are a lot of functions that are helpful uh, in this matter. I think I changed. Okay. So the next thing is data modeling. And yeah, this is the place where we uh, answer the questions. Are we able to find a pattern based on the data we have? Um, can we predict what we wanted to predict? In our case, better uh, completion rate uh, pages, traffic. And as you know, there are a lot of Python libraries uh, that can be used. I am a big fan of SKLearn because I'm a big fan of simplicity. Uh, but uh, we use also TensorFlow, but there are a lot, a lot of them. And you can definitely test uh, um, others. I think many of you in the companies have different setups, so uh, it will also depend uh, what your, on what your company is working with. What we can uh, do, all of us, uh, um, not depending on what library we will use, and I will recommend uh, to you, is starting simple. So first of all, creating a benchmark, like super simple model with not uh, sophisticated parameters, just to know what's your benchmark, what's your threshold that you are trying to be better than. Uh, because if you start with really sophisticated methods, with really complicated uh, models, you don't really know how much better you are than uh, something that is really um, achievable in five minutes. Uh, maybe not, but um, having the benchmark is really helpful even for understanding how much uh, insight is in actual data you are using. And the other thing, the other benchmark that I would recommend to use is business benchmark. Uh, so what are you trying to improve? So for some of the machine learning projects, there will not be um, benchmark like this, like the current situation. But for most web-based or business benchmarks, you can find one. So for example, we are treating whole traffic uh, as a good video at completion rate traffic. And we are targeting all of the ad campaigns uh, equally. So we can use dummy model with most frequent or defined class um, that we have uh, normally on our pages. And another thing about modeling, uh, this is similar to the uh, software development, iterate and improve. So when you start with the simple benchmark, simple model, you can then iterate and uh, test different parameters. Yeah, I have examples what you can test. You have to test <laughs> various algorithms, you can test various parameters, you can test various set features. Um, for example, all features, if you have thousands versus what if you use 10 of them, maybe 10 will be enough because sometimes you have huge data sets, but the information you're looking for is in those 10 features, actually. And um, this process, at least partially, uh, can be automated, like testing different parameters, for example. Uh, we can leave computer or server B and calculate it for us. Um, 
unless we don't know exactly what metric we are want to look at. Because with business projects, um, it's not always clear uh, if you want to focus on precision or uh, you want to focus on recall, you would like to have a balance of them. And if you talk with your uh, clients, uh, if those clients are not very familiar with machine learning, um, it can be hard to um, decide which metric is uh, crucial. We can set some thresholds, but um, it can be hard to automate whole process because we don't, uh, we cannot um, put only precision uh, to to evaluation part. And the other thing that I would like to mention is knowing when to stop, because we can spend a lot of time uh, modeling and testing and trying to get um, insight from the data, but sometimes the information is just not there. Our data is great, we believe in it, we prepared it the best way it can be, but we just cannot uh, predict what we would like to base on it. And it's nothing wrong with the data, it's nothing wrong with us. Uh, so we have to um, know when to, when to uh, say stop and maybe let's move to different project, maybe let's think of other features. Um, this uh, project just cannot work on the data we have. And the other next step of the process is communication of the results. And if you work a lot of, uh, on classification models, you can think that um, confusion matrix are, are the best way to communicate because you have predicted, you have actual classes, but if you look at a couple of examples when you have predicted in columns, here you have actual in columns and here you have class one and class two this is just weird um, so confusion matrix uh, matrix can get really confusing especially when you try to talk to people that don't do classifications don't do machine learning at all and actually as i said i work a lot with product i also um, talk with um, Sales, for example, because this project is like the cross adopt sales, um, ad engineering uh, project. So we have to know how to communicate in a business way what we achieved with the project. So actually, we from the uh, confusion matrix, there is not so far <laughs> to um, verbalizing what we achieved. So we can translate the numbers in confusion matrix for example here to we created two groups of users so we divide the traffic to two groups to users that we think are likely to watch the ads to the end and users that uh, we predict that they won't and the difference here based on this model uh, those two groups differed um, by 10 percent points and from starting uh, value, we improved by uh, 4.5 percent points. The numbers are not important. The important is that you can actually uh, tell the results in uh, like people language, uh, not only data science language. And uh, visualizations are really helpful. So here you can see the base value of, of, of video completion rate, and then we divided the traffic to two groups with higher and lower video completion rate, and people do understand that. Um, next step, implementation and production. Believe it or not, first our implementation was implementation of logistic regression, writing the mathematical formula within code of the page. Uh, it worked. It worked really well, but it was not the best way to do it. Um, the second thing, the second approach, uh, we wanted to test the decision tree, so we were not able <laughs> to just paste it. However, there is Python library that can port uh, models for, from sklearn uh, to JavaScript, and you can load after that on a page the JavaScript and 
also it worked. However, if you have bigger models, it can slow your page down. And we actually tested it on a very small portion of our traffic, and the loading time increased. So we didn't want to do um, our users that. So we have to move uh, to HTTP Python server. We had to. We'd love to uh, do that. And how it works currently, uh, step by step, we have Python service. We have, um, sorry, I'm just using uh, laser there. Uh, we have a request sent from a page. It goes to the Python service. Then the service parse parameters. It loads the model. We um, have our models in pickle files uh, on the service. It loads the features, runs predict like in uh, sklearn, because this is an example for uh, for sklearn, and prepare response, and it sends response to the front, and on the front there um, are implemented decisions, what is going on, uh, what is going to happen based uh, on the results of our prediction. And it works really well. Here are uh, Python libraries that we use for it. There are other solutions, for example, TensorFlow also have similar uh, setup uh, that you can use. Uh, at the moment it was implemented, this was better solution for us. I don't remember why exactly, but it was. Um, yeah, and the last step that I want to talk about is monitoring. And this is super important. I have a couple of points why and how can we uh, monitor, uh, what can we monitor during a, uh, during a model, um, ha having model in production, but how, ca how we do it currently. Uh, so first of all, we have Grafana uh, looking, at, looking at our uh, service. So. Uh, the Python service that is taking a request and giving respo uh, responses and doing the predictions. So we know that everything is healthy from the technical side. And we also have um, monitoring from more product, more modeling, mo modeling uh, parts. We use it currently mode because it's in our company setup. Um, it supports SQL in, and uh, Python and it reports directly on Slack. And what we are looking at during this modeling, uh, we are uh, looking if the model is not worsening with time, because uh, models get worse with time. And we uh, can observe if still we observe the differences between the uh, two groups. Uh, what is important for us, especially in this project, is to observe if the sizes of the groups um, does not uh, decrease. Because if, if, even if we have a group um, that have 100% of VCR, but the group is super small, like 1% of the traffic, it's not useful for sales. They cannot um, put any uh, ads in this traffic because it's just uh, too small. So, so it's better for us to have like a 50-50 or 30-70 uh, um, division of the traffic. So we need to look at the size. Um, usually when we roll out the model, we first uh, check it in single geo or percentage of one geo just to see if it performs well, how the service is doing. So we also can um, check if uh, next rollouts in different geos work correctly. And yeah, it shows us if uh, the whole infrastructures uh, work, so again, health check like Grafana do. Yeah, and this is all about the steps. And so uh, this is how we uh, did it. And uh, we did a couple of projects this way. And I hope after this talk, uh, you get the feeling that all of the steps are not really hard. And those libraries are not very complicated. And we actually were able to um, do it to production and it's working and um, and Python is a great language to uh, to use for uh, for such projects and the presentation is on github and yeah we don't have openings now but we will have in Q1 uh, so if you're interested this is the address uh, and I hope you 
learned something or even single thought from what I said uh, will be helpful for your project. And if you have any questions or feedback, yeah, you can ask them now or you can email me on LinkedIn me or grab me later. Okay, thank you.